Air barriers and vapor barriers are terms that are often thrown around interchangeably in the building industry, but knowing the differences between the two is critical if you want to avoid future disasters. Now, I discussed how to use vapor barriers in another video called You're Using Vapor Barriers Wrong, and we briefly touched on the importance of air barriers, but we didn't really get into the specifics. In this video, we're talking about the importance of air barriers with regard to moisture control, whether you need a vapor permeable or impermeable air barrier, and how to apply these principles to your project so that you can have a really durable building that will last for generations. Let's get into it. Air leakage in and out of a building is the second leading cause of moisture-related issues like condensation and mold growth after bulk water intrusion. Air has the capacity to hold moisture in the form of vapor, with warmer air being able to hold a lot more moisture than cold air. If we have air leaks in our building envelope, this can transport a lot of moisture into our building assemblies and raise the moisture content of the adjacent building materials, which can end up supporting mold growth and rot. For example, if we have hot, humid air leaking inside from the exterior and we're conditioning the air inside, there's a high potential for condensation to form on the backside of the drywall since that warm, moist air is coming into contact with that cold surface. And so an air barrier on the outside of the envelope is really important to preventing potential moisture issues inside the walls. On the other end of the spectrum, if it's really cold outside, Warm, moisture-laden air from the interior that leaks into the wall assembly can deposit moisture on the backside of the sheathing, and that's often where we see sheathing rot in cold climates if that moisture can't dry out. And so it's important to have an air barrier on the interior in cold climates. Now, let's say we have a standard polyethylene vapor barrier, and we poke holes through 1% of the surface of that vapor barrier. That vapor barrier is going to be 99% effective, but as an air barrier, it's mostly ineffective. This is because vapor, when it moves through diffusion, acts upon the building evenly as a distributed load, whereas air leaks deposit that moisture in a concentrated load. Building Science Corporation tested this decades ago with regard to air barrier effectiveness, which became the basis for modern day codes and air leakage tests, and they determined that air leakage leakage had the potential to transport moisture in quantities that were orders of magnitude higher than diffusion during the same time period. The test was conducted on standard 4x8 sheets of drywall in a cold climate throughout an entire heating season. The interior was kept at 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 40% relative humidity, which is fairly standard in the wintertime. The tests found that about a third of a quart of water diffused through that airtight 4x8 sheet of unpainted drywall throughout the entire heating season. The other sheet of drywall that was tested had a one square inch hole, which resulted in nearly 30 quarts of water being transported through air leakage throughout the entire heating season, which is a hundred times more than diffusion. That's the equivalent of seven and a half gallons of water passing through that one square inch hole. This is why we care about air leakage beyond just the energy penalty and the air quality issues, as it's a major driver of moisture related problems in buildings. By simply sealing that hole so that it's airtight, we can drastically reduce the amount of moisture that ends up passing through the walls by 99%. We've all heard the phrase, buildings need to breathe, and there's a lot of confusion around what this means, depending on who you ask. Buildings need to dry, people need to breathe. Buildings dry primarily via vapor diffusion and heat flow, and they get wet through air leakage. So very often this raises the question, can vapor barriers be air barriers? And often the answer is yes. Vapor barriers and vapor retarders can serve as air barriers if they are composed of a material or a membrane that can be properly sealed without any penetrations or perforations, and we more or less refer to these as vapor impermeable air barriers. The most common examples of these are self-adhering SBS rubberized asphalt membranes, which we see in a wide range of building applications where we need both an air barrier and a vapor barrier at that location, but we also see taped polyethylene being used as an air barrier as well sometimes. But the distinction that we have to make is that the vapor permeability or vapor permeance of a material or a membrane has no impact on whether it makes a good air barrier or not. And there are times where we want a vapor permeable air barrier, such as in the case of exterior walls in mixed climates, and there are times where we want a vapor impermeable air barrier, as in the case of flat roof systems, but that function as a vapor barrier is secondary to its function as an air barrier if our goal is an airtight building assembly. So how do you determine whether you need a vapor permeable or vapor impermeable air barrier, or just a regular vapor barrier? Well, we need to be asking the following questions. What is the source of moisture? Is it humid air? Is it damp concrete? Where is the source of moisture? Is it coming from the inside or the outside? Where will the moisture end up? Is it moving from the outside inwards or from the inside outwards? What is the first condensing surface? Is it ending up in the roof, the walls, the floors? 
which side of the building is warm and which side of the building is cold. This is more often than not determined by the climate, but day and night cycles have an impact on this as well, where we might have warm daytime temperatures but below freezing nighttime temperatures, as in the case of high desert climates. This gets even more complicated if we have moisture moving in different directions throughout the year. Is the building under positive pressure or negative pressure, or is it pressure balanced? If the building is under negative pressure, if we have exhaust-only ventilation, it's going to be drawing air through air leaks from the exterior. And if the home is positively pressurized, it's going to be pushing air out of the interior to the exterior. Are the adjacent materials moisture sensitive? Are we using wood framing or steel framing? Are we using gypsum sheathing or wood sheathing? Is another material in the assembly serving as an air barrier or a vapor retarder? This is a big consideration if we're trying to avoid a double vapor barrier scenario, in which moisture that finds a path into the assembly through air leakage will get trapped and won't be able to dry out. So these are a lot of things that we need to keep track of, and for the most part, we want our air barriers to be vapor permeable in order to allow for drying. But as I mentioned before, it gets complicated when we have moisture moving in different directions during different parts of the year, especially if we have hot, humid summers and cold, snowy winters. There are cases when we need the benefits of a vapor retarder in our air barriers during certain parts Parts of the year to prevent interstitial condensation within the building assemblies, but we also may need that air barrier to be vapor open during other parts of the year when moisture is drawing back to the interior. So what do we do in this case? To make things a little easier to understand, I'm going to give you a few examples of where we might want to use vapor permeable air barriers and vapor impermeable air barriers, or airtight vapor barriers. In a typical framed wall assembly in a mixed climate, meaning that we get a good mix of warm and cold weather throughout the year, but overall it's fairly mild, we probably want to use a vapor permeable air barrier. Not too permeable, but not too impermeable either, and this would allow for drying in both directions via diffusion. We need the ability to dry in both directions, and so we want to design this as a flow-through wall assembly. Now if we're building the same wall assembly in a hot, humid climate, where moisture-laden air is constantly trying to get inside through air leaks and diffusion, and has a high likelihood of condensing on the backside of the drywall, we probably want to specify a vapor impermeable or semi-permeable air barrier on the exterior of the wall assembly, but we want everything inwards to be able to dry back to the interior. We still get all that heat flow that's driving moisture back to the interior, but we want to slow down that moisture flow inwards and prevent it from getting inside at the source, which is the exterior environment. What about in a cold climate where we maybe get a few months of warm weather, but mostly cold weather? As I mentioned before, we want an air barrier on the interior, but we also probably need a vapor retarder on the interior as well. Now, notice how I'm saying vapor retarder and not vapor barrier. More specifically, it would make the most sense to use a smart vapor retarder at this location as we get all the benefits of a typical vapor barrier, but it allows for drying back to the interior during those warmer humid months, which means that moisture isn't going to be trapped in the wall assembly, potentially cause mold and rot. We can tape that smart vapor retarder membrane so that it serves as our air barrier, and we can use it in a lot of different locations to avoid having to use rigid insulation or spray foam. Guys, I hope this cleared up some confusion around air barriers and vapor barriers, and why we need to prioritize air leakage in most cases. Now of course, air sealing goes hand in hand with a good mechanical ventilation system that provides fresh filtered air to the inhabitants and exhausts moist stale air. We don't want to be pulling makeup air from air leaks, that's not good for the building or the inhabitants. For more information on air sealing new and existing buildings, head over to siri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics, and make sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already for more weekly building science content. For now, good luck with your projects, cheers.